you know, I, t I tell people I, this, I have the most remarkable job in the world. Um, it's a little bit, I mean, I have this most remarkable intellects who are on my board. And it's like having Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio and Whitey Ford, they're all together in one place and I'm the bat boy. You know, I'm the, I'm the bat boy at the All-Stars. And it's a most phenomenal opportunity for me to be around people like this and to uh, have a rare opportunity to, uh, to plumb the depth of their intellect so I can understand the world I'm in. It's, so it's, a, it's a fabulous opportunity. Uh, Dr. Brzezinski, let me just share with you a little bit of what we've been trying to do. Um, this is a project we've been working on for over a year, and we've been trying to understand the 20th century. Um, not everybody's histories are seen the, in an identical way with others. And our goal was to try to find the primary impulse uh, of the 20th century. Now, I will, uh, this is my construction, uh, so I'll say it, I, I wouldn't blame this on any of my historians. These are much better scholars than I am. But we started the 20th century when the 19th century was collapsing. The imperial structures of the 19th century were decaying and starting to implode. The Habsburg Empire, the Romanov dynasty, the Spanish Empire, the Qin Dynasty, the Ottoman Empire, uh, all of them were starting to implode. They were losing vitality. The remit of government was diminishing. And at that time, there was a rise of national impulse. But it was an impulse among elites, you know, young nationals who had a chance to go to Paris or or to Berlin or to London and to study, and they developed their own national consciousness in opposition to the collapse of this order. It was a very unique period. Uh, we don't have that today, but we have a different sort of a rise of a populist sentiment. Now, back in 1980, 2008, you gave the John Whitehead lecture at Chatham House, uh, and uh, it was a very good, it was a remarkable speech, actually. I mean, it was, it, it had insights, uh, I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I could do this, but it had insights that are really important today. Let me just quote two, two small sentences, paragraphs that you, that you had in that speech. The first you said, for the first time in history, Almost all humanity is politically activated, politically conscious, and politically interactive. Global activism is generating a surge in the quest for cultural respect and economic opportunity in a world scarred by memories of colonial and imperial domination. And then in another s s paragraph, you said that uh, this pertains to yet another fundamental change. The 500-year global domination of the Atlantic powers is coming to an end. With the new preeminence of China and Japan, you go on to say, waiting in the wings are India and perhaps a recovered Russia. So let me ask a couple of questions as it relates to these observations. You made this in 2008, but I think they were, you were seeing much further ahead than the rest of us. The, the 19th century, the global awakening was really among elites. And today, the global awakening, awakening is really a, a popular phenomena. It's young people with cell phones and internet access. And, and so the, the question I have is, you know, back then, the global elites who were the revolutionaries wanted to create nation states. The young elites, the, the, the populace today are unhappy with the governments they've inherited. Where do you think this is going? I think it's going in not a very good direction because much of the past has been ignored, particularly in the instance 
of the sort of liberated countries from foreign domination, colonialism, and so forth. And that has gone, gone through phases of change in which gradually the past was enlarged. The optimism regarding the future was diminished. The urge to imitate the West uh, has been less attractive. Uh, and the desire to settle scores uh, intensified. And I see this particularly in relationship to what is happening right now. And I was stimulated into looking at that more fully quite recently uh, when I read a rather remarkable essay by a scholar that used to be at Harvard and then at Chicago University, and I don't know where he's currently, uh, Bill Polk, William Polk. Some of you may have read that. Um, he's kind of a, uh, how to put it, intuitive, emotionally engaged reviewer of the past. And he led me in the direction which I found quite amazing. And I then asked my research assistant to explore this issue a little further, the issue namely of what really transpired and stands out increasingly in the memories of some of the newly assertive and independent states, namely the relationship with the occupier. And it became clear to me as I read that, that we're dealing here with repressed memories in one side and with ignored memories on the other side. We ignoring the past and the victims of colonialism and expansionism repressing it under the influence of the outside rulership. And that led me to look more closely at some of the data and I asked my assistant to pursue that. And we all have, of course, some understanding of what happened during those years. But at least speaking for myself, I was surprised by what was being discovered or asserted. I have no way of verifying it, but let me just give you some figures of the top of the uh, sort of uh, list here that I have, not all of them. Indonesia, Java, and Sumatra, dominated by the Dutch. You know, very solid Westerners uh, engage in trade and all of that. It's of course, colonizers, but colonization was also cultural development, blah, 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 and so forth. But in the years 1835 to 1840, about 300,000 Indonesians allegedly were killed. And that's a rather substantial number for the population of the time. And then again in 1873 to 1914, the estimate is somewhat comparable to that. I'm just skipping arbitrarily in a chronological order. In Algeria, since 1945, probably no less than at least two million Muslims were killed mm -hmm. as part of the growing conflict that would sharpen itself in recent years. Uh, one can cite examples of the British in India, hundreds of thousands, particularly in the 1857-67 conflicts. Um, Congo, huge numbers. The Belgians, such nice civilized people and uh, epitome Ruthless. of European commercial culture. Uh, it's estimated in these studies I don't have them all at hand, but I've dug this out, the, my, the help that I've cited, about 10 to 15 million may have perished. I mean, these are incredible numbers to me. They match, in some respects, what was happening first in World War I, and even more dramatically and in a more condensed period in World War II, but on a scale that is really a surprise to me. In Libya, between 1927 and 34, about two thirds of the population of Cyrenaica were killed. In recent years, in Afghanistan, the Soviets are probably responsible, we don't have very precise figures, for the death of about 850,000 to a million and a half of Afghans. Our help to them and support to them in the war 
also resulted in the death of probably more or less 500,000 civilians with a lot of civilians in this list, including students, kids, and stuff like that, because urban destruction was higher. This estimate strikes me as very high that I'm about to cite, but it's Iraq in 2003, <coughs> a war undertaken almost exclusively in response to suspicions, increasingly translated, unfortunately, into deliberate lies. And the estimate that is being circulated now seems to be excessive, but it pertains to allegedly one million dead. One can go around the world and look at these figures. I have piles of figures here from other places. And I don't mention the Indians in the United States. I don't mention the Aztec Empire in Latin America and so forth. I think history, as it becomes self-conscious, for people who experience this, is a dramatic awakening. Mm. And it points in the direction of dramatic reevaluation of their relationship with us. Not directly, but indirectly. And in the first phase of liberation and emancipation, often granted willingly by the occupier, there was gratitude and a desire to emulate the Westerner. But in time, it has shifted away from people like Nehru uh, and, uh, oh, let's say, who, who was the Senegalese leader that was in the Académie Française and so forth. Associate yourself with the external culture to an attitude which became more and more rebelling. I was led on that track by reading a poem which st struck me as very relevant and I cited it in my most recent book, Strategic Vision, in which the reaction to the West um, is becoming increasingly a challenging problem in our relationship with that huge mass of mankind. And I cite a poem by the Senegalese poet, David Diop, and I quote, in those days when civilization kicked us in the face, in other words, humiliation, when holy water slapped our cringing brows, forcible religious confirmation, the vultures built in the shadow of their talons the blood-stained monument of tutelage, mm. humiliation. I think we're dealing with aspects of that today in the Middle East. And this is what makes that task so difficult. And I'm, of course, interested not in history as such, but I'm interested in strategizing how do we deal with a phenomenon that is emotionally so deeply embedded and so dramatic in its impact. And I think, and we can talk about that more if you wish, it really calls for a strategic rethinking of the alignments involved. We have to respond because we're threatened. We have to respond because some of the threats are, ex are unacceptable. We have to respond because a lot of innocent people are being killed. But we can't entirely dismiss this background because it is so intense and so strong that it's likely otherwise to become even more dangerous. Well, I've spoken too long already, but this is what has struck me in the last few days in looking at the work of the historians here and also the, my own concern. How do we really deal with a phenomenon such as the one that we see in the Middle East? Not only in the immediate present, the question, who do we deal with? Whom do we defeat? Whom do we engage? Who is on our side, who's against us, but also the question of the sudden gradual discovery of the past, which makes out of the challengers to us into implacable enemies. And, and that is a really profound challenge. Uh, I, I'm going to go off script here. I want to explore this question uh, with you because you've, you've opened up such an interesting issue. There was a time when Europe and America had such confidence in their own moral compass that they were willing to impose it on other people. 
And now it seems that there's an ambivalence on the part of Europe about its own, and the United States, about its own moral and intellectual bearings and what it's willing to impose. Uh, do you see that as being a, a major factor here that dis distinguishes this century? Perhaps that's right, because I think imperialism in recent, in recent times, in, over the last 200 years, was imbued with a great deal of optimism and self-pride. Mm -hmm. uh, now it is increasingly a defensive mechanism against those who challenge it from a perspective which is more deep and more passionate than our own. You know, Americans, most Americans have no desire to conquer the Middle East. Yeah. And yet we I have understand. no choice but in some fashion to try to impose some degree of stability and uh, accommodation even mm -hmm. by the use of force. And we better be aware how deeply embedded are those feelings. And they translate themselves mm -hmm. not only into crimes and brutality, ex exceptional brutality, but also t terrific stamina and commitment and willingness to kill and to be killed. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we haven't enco encountered in fighting the Germans, even less in fighting the Italians. And certainly we haven't fought the Russians. We have skirmished with the Russians, but we haven't fought them. So I can't generalize how that would manifest itself, mm -hmm. but certainly probably not as deeply mm -hmm. as what may be in store mm -hmm. in the deepening engagement that is unavoidable, but better be understood well as we engage. You know, in, back when you wrote your essay and the International Herald Tribune wrote an article about your speech, um, you said, in the foreseeable future, no state or combination of states can replace the linchpin role America plays in the international system. This was back in 2008. Uh, do, do you still believe this? Do you still think America is a central linchpin for the international system? Well, maybe that was not the best choice of words, but there's no doubt in my mind, at least as of now and, and in terms of the foreseeable future, that America is the essential component of any collective effort to make political change stable and less murderous. But I think it also means that we have to be willing to differentiate between different circumstances and different compositions of the response. Um, for example, I think it's a very, very encouraging development that the recently concluded preliminary agreement on global warming, which may or may not be respected in practice over time, that this was put together by our principal European allies, genuine democracies, decent countries, uh, and the French certainly deserve most of the credit, but the British, the Germans, and others were certainly in the back of it. Uh, let's hope it goes on. I'm skeptical as to how far and how quickly it will go on, but that's good. I don't see, however, for example, the former European countries that were engaged in the Middle East being our allies in the Middle East, mm -hmm. in part because of the emphasis on what I was just placing namely the legacy of hatred and different memories between them and us in the Middle East. Mm. Um, I don't think there is any place here for the French and the British to help us with weapons. Now maybe if they engage in hospital assistance, uh, relief, uh, education, that's fine. That's part of the redemption perhaps. But when it comes to actually dealing with the problem by combining a deliberate political strategy with the use of force. They are not the ones. So then the question arises, who are our allies? Well, some of them are self-appointed mm -hmm. and are not necessarily uh, all that beneficial to us. Uh, certainly, uh, we now have some degree of collusion with the immediate countries involved. 
uh, but they're quite capable of acting on several levels at the same time in terms of their own interests. Take Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is essential economically still. Um, it is certainly changing over time. And domestically, it's beginning this sort of social uh, adaptation to current uh, uh, modes of conduct. For example, women vote, women drive. That's a very major thing in Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, who's sponsoring the religious fanatics that are operating outside of Saudi Arabia on behalf of the most extreme religious interpretation of uh, the shared religion. It's Saudi Arabia. And that makes it very difficult to reach agreements regarding some of the other countries affected by it. Incidentally, I have been told, I don't know how accurate it is, that preachers from Saudi Arabia have had already a major impact on the sort of religious attitudes of the Indonesians. That is really catching on. I don't know, and I haven't had time to look into it more fully, but it sort of struck my mind, well, what is, where is it pointing? And apparently in Malaysia, the official, so to speak, religious self-definition is already dominated by that kind of clergy. Mm -hmm. So that's one extreme. Another extreme are the Iranians, in a sense, reacting and promoting sunnah activities on behalf of Shiite. And, and, commitment and Shiite extremism in some cases. And perhaps seeking, or certainly at one point having sought, nuclear weapons. Next to them are the Israelis, who feel for their future, for their survival, are the only possessors of nuclear weapons in the area, have not used them, but have occasionally spoken of using violence, which could in the present instance, and certainly with the passage of time more likely, provoke the use of such weapons by others. Pakistan is not very far from being able to use nuclear weapons in relationship to the Middle East, not just in relationship to India. So that's another example. And one could go on on that basis. How do we, in that context, structure a joint response that may have some chance of being effective? And I'm left essentially with two countries where we may have common interests, even if we don't share the same values. One is obviously Russia. You know, I have my own scores to settle with the Russians you know, in terms of the last 30 years, but I think some sort of degree of accommodation with them on Ukraine is relevant to be able to cooperate in the Middle East. Yeah, of course, not to compromise that deprives Ukraine of its right of choice to be part of the West, but with some limitations on how that right is defined. That's why I have advocated, for example, that Ukraine not be in NATO, like Finland, mm -hmm. but otherwise be a free citizen. But that is something that has to be solved if Russia is to be engaged. Um, I think that in relationship to Russia, we can take some comfort in the fact that I think Russia is entering the final phase, the final phase of its imperial vocation. Hmm. At one point, it was a major imperial power. That's when it was at Saris Empire, in which its thrust eastward and southward was dominant in an empire in which the overwhelming mass of the population was politically ignorant but believed in the Russian Orthodox Church as, a, as epitomized by the Tsar. Mm -hmm. But the Tsar was partially German. The nobility was, in addition to some Russians, Baltic, Polish, Georgian, and so forth. That was followed by the 70, year, 70 years long experiment with communism in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, in which the non-Russians in that empire were now given <coughs> fraudulent states, limitations of states, but with all the trappings of statehood, except one, the Russians. They were not given that. <laughs> Russia as a separate <laughs> entity emerged in the 1990, after the fall of communism. And now Putin is trying to reestablish something within that context, 
that would be a combination of an empire dominated by Russia, but more voluntary in its external conduct, uh, the Eurasian Union. Well, of course, the newly independent states saw through that very quickly. And one of their leaders came back very quickly and others got on with it by announcing, no, 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 not Eurasian Union, Eurasian Economic Union. That's okay with us, but that's all. And I think that is absolutely, uh, totally uh, transforming mm. of what the prospects for Russia are. Mm. The best prospect Russia has is as a national state, which means it loses Central Asia, it loses those places where it has been trying to oppress, and it goes to Europe, thereby hoping to retain its current territories in the East. Now, what am I leading to next? China. Some of those territories are an integral part of what the Chinese describe as uneven treaties. And they have identified them, by and large, quite often. And some of them they have not identified uh, deliberately. And those are the treaties that involve the transfer of a lot of territory to Russia. Mm -hmm. But they're beginning to talk about it. In my own meetings with, Russia, uh, with Chinese generals, I have heard spontaneous references to uh, uneven treaties involving specifically Chinese and the Russians and territories. And now they have come with this proposal for one belt. Uh, one belt, one road. One road, yeah. What is it? It's a design for de facto political and economic shift in the degree of shared domination of Central Asia mm. with, the, with the Russians. So the Russians are, I think, in spite of Putin's efforts, and in some respects, because of them, because they've been inept, are facing mm. the prospect of becoming, sooner than they expected, a limited European-type state if it is to retain its position. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that is tremendously significant to what is happening in the Middle East. Because my bottom line, and here I stopped these rather long comments, is we have to work with the Russians, and we have to draw in the Chinese. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to have the Chinese sit on the sidelines, benefit from the preservation of some degree of stability in the Middle East, which is of central importance to their economic and political well-being, without sticking their fingers in here and helping. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that is my concern, because without them, I don't think we can work well with the Russians alone. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the French and the British, for reasons I have mentioned, can help us. Uh, maybe some others, maybe Pakistanis and others could. But by and large, we need the help of the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, and that, I think, is a very, very major task, which will require a lot of patience and also intelligence on our part. Because what are we doing at the same time? We're signing agreements for the sale of arms on an increasing scale to India. Uh, we are talking with the Chinese <coughs> Japanese about friendship and joint participation, but we're also announcing publicly that we're pivoting to the Far East, mm -hmm. which means a military redeployment against whom? Against the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't have it both ways. If the Chinese are to help us in the Middle East, and I think their help is absolutely essential, uh, we have to choose. We have to choose. And I think we're reluctant to choose because we're reluctant to be fully engaged. And we haven't had time or willingness to strategize and of attitudes at the sort of higher level of Washington type thinking are now increasingly politically divided, including some people who now would like to repeat what we did 2003, which I think has become a disaster. And more generally, the national attitude is one of pervasive ignorance as to what is involved. Uh, big, let me just take you to a conversation we had in our discussion with the scholars this morning. You know, I think it was uh, Professor Chen that, that pointed out the tension between, within America's own formulation. On the one hand, we espouse the San Francisco Agreement and hold up images of a world order that was um, 
favorable to our interests. But then we behaved in ways that were clearly a realpolitik narrow conception. We didn't, you know, we, there was a distance between our, our values and our interests. Now you've been a, not only a, a, a scholar of the era, you were actually a practitioner of the era. And uh, we've always had this tension between holding up ideals and then having to deal with pragmatic problems. Can, can you share with us how you thought through that when you were at government? Well, holding up ideals is essentially a kind of aristocratic privilege of the, to which the, the better educated <laughs> and the more engaged are entitled. It really, I don't think, commands too much public engagement. And I think public reacts you know, on, ba on the basis of what it feels. If we get into a messy <coughs> war, and a lot of corpses begin to come back to America, the public becomes engaged. If we get attacked on a much larger scale, something reminiscent of previous large-scale wars, the public becomes very engaged and very emotional. And the war against the Japanese because of Pearl Harbor, and the war against the Germans because of the attacks in Europe, and the public understanding increasingly that behind that war there was a horrible policy of mass killings that the Germans were pursuing, genocide, concentration camps. The public responds to that. But anything less than that, I think the public is not terribly engaged unless it feels the pain itself. And we may be coming to that if something that has happened recently here becomes more and more repetitive. Uh, and this is why I think it's quite likely, I don't want to even elaborate it, mm. Uh, mm. if we become more engaged, I think we better have others with us who share some similar concerns. The Russians have reasons to share concerns because a significant portion of the Russian population is Muslim. The Chinese have some interest magnified by economic interests. And we shouldn't give them the luxury of staying on the sidelines. But we can't expect them to be treated by us as a possible, uh, not enemy, but possible foe of some sort, and at the same time as our partner. So we have to think, which way do we go? Do we organize an alliance with the Indians? and the Japanese, maybe the Koreans, and certainly the Australians and others uh, as a barrier to Chinese aspirations? Or do we kind of lower the level of commitment or engagement, even on our own part in that regard? I'm still very much mindful of the fact that to this day, I believe it's once a week, but you know much better. You were happy to say your defense we hold an over, we, we run an overflight right next to the Chinese shore, and we have naval ships doing that. Now, if the Chinese were doing that to us next to San Francisco and LA, how long would we tolerate that? But what about the first? Am I right on that? <coughs> it's probably a couple of times a week. Well, there you are. You know. <laughs> Um, let, let me just, if I may, shift just to ask. Um, authoritarian governments seem to now do a far better job of channeling the tools of social media to send a message than democracies. Um, we're living in a time, you wrote, you've written this, a, a time with a, <coughs> a rising popular political consciousness. And we seem not to be able to deal very effectively with creating messages to that consciousness. Is this a worry to you? Well, <clears throat> yes, it, it, it is a worry, but it's not yet where it could become really significant, but it's heading there. There's no doubt, if we're speaking of the same thing, and maybe we're not, there's no doubt that the Russians have organized an extremely extensive network yes, yeah. of commentators, analysts, contributors, 
some with real names, some with fake names. The ones yeah, with the yeah, real names yeah. are sometimes highly paid Americans who go out of their way using the web to slander people they don't like. And because of what I have been saying and writing, I think there is some confusion in Russia regarding me now. <laughs> some of them still feel that I deserve every single possible calumny that they can throw at me and accuse me of any conceivable crime. But then there are others by now who feel, well, maybe I have somehow or other regained my brains and I'm of a different orientation currently. But it shows some kind of yeah. lack of calculus. And of yeah. course, these I follow more closely. But it is a well-organized campaign, very well-organized campaign. We had a very good campaign for democracy and freedom with Radio for Europe and with the book programs and all that sort of stuff during the Cold War. I don't see anything like that right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still do have, you know, Voice of America, which gives the news at a time when Voice of America is not that much of an attractive uh, and mysterious penetration of the once existing Iron Curtain. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. makes it, I think, less effective. No, I don't think we have thought it through, and I don't think we have thought through what it means if Russia does become a normal, largely European country, who is which is concerned with the threat from the East, uh, even as it tries to cooperate with it, because that neighbor is there. Our relationship, for example, with Mexico, I think would be very different if Mexico uh, had a you know, billion people living in it. Uh, and that's the choice they face, mm. more than that. Mm. A billion people who are developing so quickly mm -hmm. and so effectively and so ambitiously uh, that I don't think any sane Russian 10 years from now can continue doing what Putin has been doing, which is alienating us. Yeah. Pardon me. Um, you personally hosted uh, Deng Xiaoping in your home, I know, uh, and you had a close relationship with him. He's famous for having said, and I'll, let me quote this, uh, that China uh, should observe calmly, secure our position, cope with affairs calmly, hide our capacities, and bide our time, maintain a low profile, and never claim leadership. Um, is China behaving today the way Deng Xiaoping thought they should? Well, in some respects, yes. That is to say, militarily. Because their efforts to improve their military posture and perhaps to acquire some degree of co-equality or maybe even superiority is still rather masked. It's not open. And what they do with the cyber weaponry mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. not very clear. And obviously, it gives them potentially rather significant options. On the other hand, when it comes to the other aspects, the material um, condition of China, well, the change is phenomenal, undeniable. There's every reason to be proud of it. And it sends a lesson. So they're less humble. There's no doubt about it. They're much less humble. I think some of the humility, especially in the time when I was dealing with the Deng, was contrived mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. very deliberate. Mm -hmm. I think right now the pride is there because you cannot be pr not proud if you look at what they have done in Usually 20, 25 sense. years. Yeah. It's st yeah. staggering. Yeah. And in that sense, it gives them influence. Uh, they can really influence a lot of countries around the world. And this is why they're an important potential ally because they should know, and I think they do know, that the conflict in the Middle East erupts in a variety of directions. First of all, it becomes geographically more spread. Second, it results in some conflict between Iran and Israel, which leads to the use, maybe even selective one only, of nuclear weapons. That's another problem. If any of that happens, they suffer because of its impact on the global economy and the specific aspects of that global economy insofar as it involves transit of uh, natural resources across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Indian mm -hmm. Ocean. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a propensity to celebrate victimhood, that they were abused, and that well, this is, an, and there's no question they were. Yeah. I mean, I, China, I think, was badly abused by the 
world powers. Um, but this seems to be, a, you know, at the time when they're so strong, seems to be too prominent a theme in their narrative for their current role in Asia. Yeah, it may be deliberately used, maybe deliberately used. Mm -hmm. But if you talk with them at greater length, even in a small group, uh, the pride comes through mm -hmm. increasingly, mm -hmm. manifestly, mm -hmm. and justifiably. Uh, That's remarkable. Yeah, but I think we have to be smarter, uh, not to engage in activities which justify them viewing us as enemies, uh, which we're doing of them to some extent, and at the same time giving them a free ride, for example, in becoming the major power involved in the Middle East, with, and no one with us. And the Russians won't go in with us alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for all of the potential danger to Russia from China, in the short run, the Russians still find the Chinese helpful as a source of protection, uh, mm -hmm. as not leaving them alone, because otherwise, who's really their ally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My God, a country like Belarus the other day has started negotiating some sort of security arrangement with the Ukraine. Yeah. It's, it's staggering what is happening. Uh, so I think the Chinese also have to make adjustments mm -hmm. and uh, get off this notion that they are for peace only and nothing else, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, more complicated interests. Yeah. Yeah, let me, uh, forgive me for taking so long with my questions. I want to ask one more and I'll turn to to all of you, back in, in uh, you wrote an essay in the International Herald Tribune about five years ago. And in that, you wrote that America needs to undertake, let me quote, a deliberate effort to nurture a wider coalition committed to the principle of interdependence and prepared to play a significant role in promoting a more effective global management. Um, as you look to the current debate in our primary system, do you <laughs> see anyone that has a vision that you think we need for the future? Well. <laughs> that was a trick question. Yeah. Do I see anyone who has a vision? But that forces me to nominate the candidate <laughs> that I would support. I prefer to wait with any sort of public declaration on that score, at least for some time. I think the basic problem is that we have, first of all, uh, on this issue, uh, an abysmally ignorant and indifferent public. Sure, the public's now a little excited, a little excited yeah. because yeah. there was some assassination. And that's horrible, absolutely horrible. And I can understand that. But it's still a you know, minority phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. one can, depending where one is located and what one's origins are, one can even balance that with, let's say, the excessive use of force by uh, the police forces resulting in, in deaths, numerous deaths, of mm -hmm. a portion of our citizenry that happens mm -hmm. to have different mm -hmm. uh, racial antecedents. Yes. Uh, yeah. you know, let's be fair about it. It's terrible. It's yeah. a terrible problem. Terrible problem. Yeah. Yeah. So at this stage, I think the public is really not deeply engaged in reflecting on what the international scene has in store for the United States if we don't act intelligently with foresight, with some degree of genuine seriousness about our commitment, but on the basis of some, some form of a coalition mm -hmm. that can be contrived perhaps mm -hmm. with the countries I have mentioned. Mm -hmm. Plus, of course, mm -hmm. some countries in the area. Uh, Egypt has obviously to be involved, if it can be, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. one example. I think if Saudi Arabia were involved only one, in one direction only, it would be much easier than if it has a formal and an informal set of objectives, not, not all of which are compatible with one another. With Iran, a great deal depends on how the agreement is enforced. And I said publicly, and some people picked this up, I thought it was a good formula, that this is not a pact, like some treaties, but this is a program, and a program for seven or so, eight years of unfolding. And therefore, it will change over time, whereas a pact has to be implemented immediately and exactly as it is. And hopefully, 
those parts of it that are extre extremely difficult for the Iranians to swallow will become easier to swallow with the passage mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. But the reverse might happen. Mm -hmm. It could harden the wrong way. Yeah. Do we have uh, microphones to move around? So let me just ask you, are there questions that colleagues would like to ask? Uh, let me, uh, let, well, right down here in the very front, our Turkish scholar is going to pose the first question. Uh, thank you uh, for taking time. I, my, my question is about the first uh, introduction you made about the suppressed colonial memory of humiliation, uh, which is a very powerful point. We know from China to the Arab countries and in India that notion of humiliation was important. But after the, the moment of independence, that notion of humiliation was matched with the notion of redemption and salvation. So it could psychologically end very well and people can move on, as China did. But then something happened in the 60s and 70s in the Middle East and the Arab context where several wars and events recovered earlier narratives of humiliation and made it worse and worse. And, and so I wonder, but looking back to the 70s, do you feel you know, things could have been different with different American policies? Is there, is there any events or policies you thought you wish was done differently? Well, and that will change the narrative and that will change the relationship. I'm not sure I understand you correctly, and please stop me if I don't. Um, as I understand you, could the past be different from what it was, right? No, the interpretation of the past. Be, <laughs> so we, when, when you talk about the humiliation yeah. from the generation of Ataturk to Nasser, at least the, you know, these nationalist leaders say that, OK, we, we were humiliated, but it's over. That we, right. we won. There could have been Mao Zedongs and, and Nehru's of, of their countries. And then well, Arab-Israeli wars, Iranian revolution, Camp David, there was some sort of right. new actor saying that humiliation keeps going on. But I'm thinking more when I say that I refer to this humiliation and that poetry that I read. It's not involving, by and large, countries like Turkey or Egypt, uh, maybe even the Chinese, because these are countries with such rich, demonstrably significant cultural background that it creates an absorbing um, phenomenon for those who resented it. It becomes a, something which is a deviation from the norm. Part of the problem is that in many former colonial areas, uh, domination from the outside was a shock that began to be felt more deeply with the permeation into these countries of Western values and thinking, and was also spread upon the return to these areas of the colonial troops that were forcibly mobilized by the French and the British particularly, died in huge numbers in World War I and World War II. And that then created an awareness when the time came for them to start asserting their national aspirations of the scale of the deprivation that was experienced and imposed on them. Professor Chan, please. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful you know, uh, dialogue. And I actually have a um, historical question, which is also is a, a contemporary, close contemporary relevance. A few weeks ago, and I was in a conference in Shanghai, and Ezra Vogel of Harvard University mentioned when he was asked what was the most important year in modern Chinese history, and he mentioned it should be 1978, 1979. What happened that year was were two you know, important events. One was the launch of China's reformed opening project. Another one was normalization of Chinese-American relations. Actually, the two were closely interrelated. And uh, shortly after the announcement of normalization, you know, on December the 15th, 1979, of course, you have major, major, uh, uh, December 1978, uh, uh, yes, there were major actors there. Uh, Deng Xiaoping visited the United States. And on his way, in the flight to the US. Reportedly, he mentioned to his aides, he said, 
he record, he record, recording history, you find all those countries who are with the United, third world countries with the United States are all successful. And all those who are against the United States, those are not as successful. We shall be on the side of the United States. And this is a huge you know, statement which connects the two events together. Now 30 some years have passed and China has been successful but also facing challenges. Will you, given that historical background, and you are a major, major you know, uh, participant in that process in making that happen, will you say China today is an insider or an outsider of the existing international order? I would say it's, it's an insider Thank you. because of the influence that is sheer weight uh, and uh, financial capability and so forth makes possible. Till then, you know, China was always viewed as very impressive, great deal to be learned and admired, but not as capable of being decisive and acting on a global scale, maybe towards its neighbors. But today, China is a global power, and I think that changes things very much and much faster than one would have expected. I'm surprised by how fast it has been and how extensive it has been. And I sense that it is having an impact on the psyche of, of the Chinese. When I first started going to China, there was a lot of kind of, to some extent, not very sincere, but meaningful, effort to kind of denigrate oneself, kind of quasi-apologies, we are backward, we're not this, we're not that. Very little of that today, and increasingly a kind of more assertive tone on some issues, and especially so in the military. And in the military, especially so in the Navy. And, and I think that's connected with what has happened and has been so remarkably successful. I mean, if, it's simply undeniable that what the Chinese have done and are doing is way ahead of anything that on a conscious, deliberate basis any other country has been able to achieve. Yeah. And that has international implications. I don't think personally, for example, to revert to the subject that interests me here, namely, what do we do next? I really don't think we're going to have a very stable world order unless we deal successfully with the Middle East and we can't deal successfully with the Middle East on our own. And we have to have, in one way or another, the Russians and the Chinese, and particularly the Chinese, engaged. And we'll know whether I'm right or wrong, probably within a decade. Mm -hmm. But the decade, in the meantime, can be very unpleasant in either case. If we don't, it will become more clear that this is a disaster. If we're making some progress, it's still not to be clear for quite some time whether we'll be successful. And that will depend on whether the Russians then realize that this has implications for their relationship, particularly with Europe, because only Europe, Russia accommodation, can create a truly modern Russia. And that will not be clear to the Chinese if it's worthwhile until they begin to realize that they don't do this kind of informal, gradually increasing partnership with us the whole thing could begin to be exceed, exceedingly costly for them and even dangerous in terms of the kind of coalitions that might emerge against them. We have time for one last question. Uh, well, maybe I'll do two. I'm going to get you two. So we'll take it right over here, and I'm going to ask you both to give your question, and I'll let Dr. Brzezinski respond. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court World Docs. Uh, are you proud of having initiated the practice of arming Islamic extremists? I'm sorry, what? Are you proud of having initiated the practice of arming Islamic extremists, Afghanistan in other words? No, I'm not proud because I didn't. Yeah, I don't know that that's a real question. Let, yeah. Let's take this question right down I here, supported, sir. I supported the Algerians. I'm, I supported the Algerians. And, and in the Far East, I supported the Mujahideen when the Russians came in to dominate their country. Well, it's not a question of chronology. There are two separate cases. Okay, last question, right down here, please, sir. 
Hi, my name is Matt Sullivan. I'm with KEI, um, Korea Economic Institute. My question is uh, a little more general than that. I was thinking about, in the context of your latest book, you talk about a diminishing uh, sort of Western power, uh, American power included, and I was wondering, uh, with some of our American allies, like uh, India and Japan, that have very strong nationalisms, uh, which could be um, sort of catalysts towards uh, a conf international conflict, like India and Chinese, or yeah, Indian and Chinese relations. Do you think the United States uh, has the ability to exercise restraint over its allies still? Do you think it's uh, America's responsibility to um, help restrain its allies, you know, uh, so there's no, there's a less degree of conflict or escalation between its allies and, say, China, for example? Well, obviously, the impact on, on the world scene of a country with China's current capabilities is much greater than the impact of India on the world scene. But I think we have to be also conscious of the fact that if you look at the world from the vantage point of Beijing, how we treat the Indians in contrast to how we treat the Chinese is also a matter of, of relevance and concern. And I've already said, mentioned that, the fact that we, for example, sell arms or provide arms uh, for a fee um, to the Indians but maintain a boycott of the sale of arms to the Chinese must obviously be food for thought by the Chinese. They must ask themselves why. Uh, the incidents on the border between China and India were kind of mixed provocations. They were not one-sided. Uh, and uh, for the Chinese, it certainly is a question of some relevance, especially when they're trying to open up, for example, access to the West via the Indian Ocean and all that. Uh, I'm not justifying the Chinese as saints or uh, painting the others as being misguided. I'm merely saying that from our point of view, if we're to prevail in the Middle East, we have to have significant allies with us. And who are they? I would love to see Japan more involved, but Japan has specific problems with the past, its own making, and its a product of history, and I don't think the Japanese are all that interested in getting involved militarily in any sort of meaningful fashion in the Middle East conflicts. So who are our potential allies? For whom growing instability in the Middle East will be increasingly harmful? in terms of their economic well-being and growth. Well, if the radicalization uh, of the Muslim uh, communities, entities that pervade all that area, all the way into China and Xinjiang and all the way through Central Asia, becomes increasingly bellicose, it will be directed at them and the Chinese. So they do have, objectively speaking, a serious reason for acting seriously and not leaving this to us as a problem that we should resolve on our own, perhaps with some sympathetic thoughts entertained in the process, or perhaps with the quiet calculus that this will speed up their ascendancy and our decline. That's also possible. Uh, they better think of their long-range interests here in having this problem solved before it gets out of hand. It is still a problem that can be solved. The American public doesn't fully understand its complexity, far from it, and the region itself is incapable of generating it entirely on its own because specific quarrels, uh, whether it's between the Sufis and the Shiites or between the Israelis and the Iranians and the Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the Turks, yeah, and the others in the area uh, is making it very difficult to structure a larger, sort of effective, intelligent, uh, self-contained response 
that can impose some degree of cooperative order on this region. And those who are responsible for that in recent years, for better or for worse, like the French and the British, are certainly not the candidates to do it anymore, nor are they eager to do it. So who's to do it? You know, all of us here in this room are students of the, uh, the 20th century, uh, and so we've been looking at these hundred years, and here you are, you've been a maker of that history for the last 50, so I think we all want to say thank you to you for a remarkable afternoon. Would you please thank the <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>